Christian Parenting. Welcome to the Bible for Kids podcast with your host, best-selling children's author, Amy Parker, and author and co-creator of VeggieTales, Mike Naraki. If instilling biblical values in kids is important to you, this podcast will give you the resources, wisdom, and hope to do just that. Now, let's join our hosts, Amy and Mike, for this week's episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Bible for Kids podcast. I'm Mike Naraki. And I'm Amy Parker, and today we're speaking with Chris Fabry, who has done just about everything. But we're going to focus on his page-turning mystery series for kiddos and maybe get to everything else, too. But first, we like to start every episode of the Bible for Kids with a Bible verse. Mike? Beyond question, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the word, taking up and taken up in glory. And that's from first Timothy three sixteen of the NASB. Chris Fabry is an award-winning author and radio personality who hosts the daily program, Chris Fabry live on Moody radio. He is also heard on love worth finding building relationships with Dr. Gary Chapman and other radio programs. In 2020, he was inducted into the Marshall University School of Journalism and Mass Communications Hall of Fame. That's a mouthful. (laughs) A native of West Virginia, Chris and his wife, Andrea, now live in Arizona and are the parents of nine children. Nine. Whoa, that's amazing. Yes. Wait for it. (laughs) <laughs> I was going to do a drum roll of uh, nine children. Chris's novels have won. You want to do a drum roll? Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know if you can even hear that. Yeah. Chris's <laughs> novels have won five Christie Awards, an ECPA Christian Book Award, and two awards of merit from Christianity Today. He was inducted into the Christie Award Hall of Fame in 2018. His books include movie novelizations such as War Room and Overcomer, and novels for children and young adults. He co authored the Left Behind the, Ki- the Kids series with Jerry B. Jenkins and Tim LaHaye, as well as the Red Rock Mysteries and the Wormling series with Jerry B. Jenkins. He encourages those who dream of writing with his website, Mm heyyoucanwrite.com. Find out more about his books at chrisfabry.com. Chris, welcome to the show. So good to talk to you again and have you on. Mike, it is great to talk with you and Amy. Thanks for your interest in stories and for kiddos, as you say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I still have to get used to, I, I'm hearing the kiddos more in the vernacular now. Amy's been using it for a while. I'm, I'm still trying to get used to that. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, the, the, your bio alone could, could fill a podcast, you know, so uh, that's, that's, it's, 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 you know, you've, you've done some things as she said, all good, all good things. Um, but uh, can you rewind a few years and tell us how you got started in Christian media Um which came first, you know, radio or writing? It's kind of a chicken or the egg question, maybe. So uh, h- how did you get started in all this? You know, I was a um, I was a senior, a junior in high school, and a teacher came to me and said, how would you like to go to school a half day and work at a radio station half day? Uh, it was a distributive yes. education <laughs> club thing. Wow. And I said, I, I really wasn't that interested in radio. You know, I liked performing. I liked art. I liked writing. I like songs, you know, all that stuff. But I thought, well, you know, this would be kind of good. This would be kind of cool. And my very first radio station manager said, Chris, if you do this, he called me favorite favorite. If you do this, it'll be in your blood the rest of your life. (laughs) And he was right. You know, Mm. it was just something that I came to naturally. I enjoyed it. It was a, it was an AM station. So it signed on at sunrise and signed off at sunset. And so every night I would sign off and I'd go back in the production room and just play around and just have fun and write skits and call people on the phone and, you know, record them and do those types of things. So the radio came first for me as far as getting paid for it, Mm -hmm. but I've always been a writer. I've all, and I think that radio is, you know, what we're doing right now as we are talking, I'm, I'm really writing. I'm just not doing using my fingers, you know, to Mm -hmm. longhand or to type. I'm just, taking what is in here and in here and trying to communicate it well. So there, there are different um, 
they, they work out differently, but they're really the same thing. And I, you know, as a kid, I read and I really wanted to do when I was moved by a story, I really thought I want to do that for somebody else someday. I want to write something that touches them like the red fern grows or Charlotte's web or the Hardy boys. I, I always read the Hardy boys. Oh, and I'm I thought such a big Hardy boys fan <laughs> myself. Absolutely. Yeah. I still remember that lighthouse on a cliff in the boat. Yeah. down below. I remember that, <laughs> that, that cover. Well, that's so cool. And it's so cool that you could, you could be at that point at that age where you could see that for yourself, you know, cause I, you know, a lot of kids would think, Oh, this is something that somebody else does. Um, and I possibly couldn't do this, but it was, it's, it's neat that, that you could, you could actually envision that for yourself at that age. Did you have a model for that in your life? No, you know, I, I did. I thought that, that you went out and picked books from the book tree. You know, I had no idea <laughs> that you could actually write and, and what it took to be an author, but the, the, what Amy mentioned, Hey, you can write.com. Uh, there was a professor at the local college who judged a um, forensics competition that I was in. Mm -hmm. And I, you had to read two minutes of prepared news, something that you had written, you had to do a commercial and then read two minutes of uh, unprepared news, just kind of rip and read. Yeah. And on the corner, I can still see it in my mind on the corner in red felt uh, ink, Boz, Boz Johnson was his name, wrote, hey, comma, you can write exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first time that I really, I, you know, I, I had family members and, and people that I would, you know, st other students and even teachers at, at high school and junior high that would say, Hey, you know, you, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. But that was the first time that I ever had anybody who actually wrote for a living. He was a news director, uh, actually was the president of the RTNDA, the radio and television news directors association over Walter Cronkite and David Brinkley and everybody. He was wow. the first person who said to me, you have a gift, you have something special here. And he became my advisor then when I went to college and, uh, it's, you know, the, the rest is, is history, right? Well, that's yeah. amazing. And it's so, it, it, it speaks to the power of modeling, uh, you know, for kids and, you know, just, just giving them, you know, that, that sense that you can do that. You know, I live in the Franklin area now in Nashville, Tennessee, and I see it here. Like, you know, I grew up, my dad was in the air force. We grew up all over the country, but never in an area where there was, you know, where like entertainment or the arts were emphasized, you know? And so, you know, I, I grew up thinking, oh, you know, not even imagining that would be a possibility for myself, but, but here in this, in this environment, you can kind of see, you know, kids grow up like, okay, yeah, that, that can be a possibility even in ministry, you know, uh, you yep. know, you know, the arts or writing or, 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 or entertainment can, can be a way to use my gifts for God. So, but yeah, just, it's so important to, 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 to illuminate that for kids at a young age. And so when our producer, Dan, told us that you were coming on, I immediately knew who you were from your radio show, which has been going on for, for quite a while. And you, you know, on that show, you, you just tackle some spiritual conversations. Um, so why do you think it's important? Why do you basically dedicate your life to keep the conversation going about our faith and our spiritual lives? Well, I think that's where you know, the rubber meets the road. It's where we all, it's, it's that daily struggle that we slog through. And that's the place where we, our faith, we, it, we make it real. And, uh, I had a, a mentor radio pastor, Donald Cole, that I knew for years and years. And he said something that I comes back to me every day. And he said, struggle is not a sign of failure. Struggle is a sign of life. And I think most people, you know, most listeners who call in with some struggle feel like they're failing God, that they haven't measured up. They haven't done. I feel it every day when I sit down to write or do my radio program. It's like, oh, I've got this struggle in my life with family or friends or my faith. And, you know, I do have doubts or a question that I have. And that struggle is not the sign that I have you know, turned my back on God or that he's turned his back on me. The struggle means that I am, I'm doing life. This is real life. Real life is struggle. And anybody that, uh, for example, in marriage, any married couple that tells you we've never had any fights, we've never had any struggle, you know, you have to wonder what's going on in their lives because 
I think it's the, it's the, at the point of struggle that you figure out what is true and what is real about yourself and about who God is. Uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to twist God's arm to do what I want him to do. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm just now <laughs> learning that it's not about getting him to do what I want him to do or what I think he ought to do or how he ought to do the plan that I have here. The plot of my life, the story of my life is filled with conflict and struggle. And it's in the time of conflict that I grow the most. And I, you know, I don't like that. I don't like the conflict and the pushback. I want ease, ease and everything to be easy. But I, I really see that that's, that's true for me. And I think it's, so that's why I do that. That's why I write these stories. That's why I do my radio program to connect with that real life. Well, and that's what, you know, they, they say about story, right? Story is conflict. And, uh, and we're, 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 we are, we are creatures of story because that's, that reflects our lives. And I love, I love, you know, that kind of that, that framing to look at it, that doing life is, is, is about struggling through that. So um, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back on the Bible for kids. My arms will hold you tight a whimsical board book from mother-daughter writing duo, Crystal Bowman and Terry McKinley, is filled with masterful rhymes and beloved animals, including llamas, elephants, sloths, and fun surprises like bats and flamingos, that brings the tenderness of heartfelt love between baby animals and their parents to life. A perfect gift, this book will appeal to the whole family and is sure to be a favorite book of mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, and other caregivers to read to their precious little ones. My Arms Will Hold You Tight is available now wherever books are sold. From the creators of the One Year Daily Acts of Friendship comes 100 Daily Acts of Friendship for Girls. Strong, healthy friendships offer a safe place for girls to be themselves and share their deepest feelings. But how do they build lasting friendships? One of the key ingredients to having good friends is learning to be a good friend. Designed for Girls 8 to 12, 100 Daily Acts of Friendship for Girls teaches what God says about friendship and will give them practical, everyday tips for developing lifelong relationships. Each devotion includes a scripture verse, a short story about friendship, questions to ponder, and a daily act of friendship section with ideas for living out what they have learned. Girls will not only learn how to develop godly friendships with others, but will discover how to be friends with Jesus, the friends who will never disappoint and will always stand beside them. 100 Daily Acts of Friendship for Girls is available wherever books are sold. With the tenderness of a mother speaking directly to her child, best-selling author Karen Kingsbury uses her heartwarming book, Let Me Hold You Longer, to remind us that the years of childhood fly too quickly by us. Most of us faithfully remember and capture our children's firsts. Karen encourages readers to try to recognize and savor the often fleeting lasts, the last days of kindergarten and last at bats in Little League amid the whirlwind of life. This poignant reminder has taken on a whole different meaning as families have adapted to quickly changing circumstances in a pandemic, and in some cases, let go of everyday routines while experiencing many unexpected lasts. This book makes a perfect gift for baby showers, new moms, seasoned moms, recent graduates, and anyone else who needs a reminder to savor the last moments of childhood. Let Me Hold You Longer is available wherever books are sold. Welcome back to the Bible for Kids podcast. And Mike and I are speaking with Chris Fabry. So Chris, you were talking about uh, struggle and a lot of times that comes up in the context of relationships. Um, and uh, you, you and your wife co-host a show on relationships with uh, none other than uh, Gary Chapman. Um, so uh, do you want to drop your biggest and best relationship advice <laughs> for listeners right now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, you know, I, I learned so much from Gary and he kind of reveals my heart to me every, every program that we do. I, I just can't believe the longevity of the, this guy. Um, and, and how he's done this for 80 plus years now, he's been walking on the planet and doing the love languages, the way that that, uh, connects with people's hearts and, you know, the struggles that they have. I don't know that I have any real big, uh, (laughs) news about that. You know, my wife and I were married in 1982. So do the math, the years between that, we say we've had 10 
happy years together. <laughs> and it's the 30 plus. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, I think that, that that whole thing about the struggle is, is true that uh, if you look at marriage as always smooth sailing and no waves, then very quickly you're going to see after the the tingles as Gary calls them after those wear off 12, 18 months. Uh Yeah. You're not, you know, you're, you're, you're in for some hard time. Then you add kids to that. And then you add nine kids to that. (laughs) Um, it, It is a struggle. So if you look at marriage as something that I want to make me happy in the long run, I want to fulfill me. You know, that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is, I'm in this for the growth and the, and, and what I give to the other person, what I give to her and what I am able to give to my kids, because that's, what's really going to last in the end. And that will lead you to fulfillment and true love. The same kind of love that God expressed to us. You know, he, he gave, uh, when it was, when it cost him a lot and when it hurt him, he gave his love. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I love that. I love that perspective. That relationship is not only about, you know, that person who's perfect for me, that's going to make everything smooth, but this is, (laughs) there, there's, there's a growth mindset. It's like, okay, no, this is going to be hard, but, but that struggle is going to make me grow and make me a better person and make us better as, as a couple. Um, yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah. And a lot of it's about the expectations that you bring in. I, uh, my co-author actually, Trisha Goyer, um, wrote a book about the grumble for a year. And she talks about how when we grumble, um, that's just the, the term that she uses. It's a lot of times because we come into it with, with um, m- not really wrong, but not, you know, not the right expectation that grumbling is a result of our expectations that were um, sometimes misinformed or whatever. And so if we expect marriage or any relationship to be just completely smooth sailing and that person to complete me or whatever, then um, we're probably going to do a lot of grumbling if, <laughs> if we expect yes. smooth seas the entire time. So I'm guessing you and your wife are basically relationship experts with nine children. <laughs> That's a lot of different personalities, a lot of different relationships under one roof. Um, so tell us a little bit about your children and how this career has helped and challenged and shaped your family life? You know, my, for my oldest daughter was born in 1985, Erin. And of the nine kids that we have, she is the only one who's married. And I always get the question, you know, do you have grandkids yet? Because people who are younger than me have tons of grandkids. We don't have any grandkids yet, <laughs> which is okay. You know, it's yeah. like, that's the other grumbling thing, the unrealistic expectations that you're talking about. If I want my life to end up with a billion grandkids and I don't have them, well, where's God in that? Um, but we learned, you know, it, with 85, 87, 89, 90, uh, and then 94, there was almost like two families, the, the older kids and then the younger kids. Yeah. And what we found was that younger generation, they were very much into radio dramas and adventures to see the type of, but then as and, uh, all of the, the video type stuff. So we would McGee and me, those types of things. And so we would allow the kids a half hour a day to kind of sit in the blue chair and watch the, watch the tube. And uh, it became progressively harder and harder to, to, but when the, there was so much, you know, great content there for them to uh, be able to, to hone that down to a half an hour. But reading was another great thing that we had them do and reading to them, reading with them, and then them catching the, you know, the idea of books that has been a huge thing. And it's been, it was really neat to be on the radio at this time and be able to say, you know, the, the guys who did veggie tales, well, that's him. He's going to be on my program today. You know? <laughs> Larry, the cucumber is going to be there. And they got their, you know, Bill Myers and, and others uh, that they would read through the years that they made a connection that these are not just these, you know, super people out there that do this. These are real flesh and blood people just like you. And, you know, some of them they got to meet. And uh, I remember Michael Card, 
who lives there close to you in Franklin, yeah. uh, came to our house one day and he took my daughter who was home from school. He took her to McDonald's. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, to get classy to see like Michael that. card. <laughs> yeah, Michael Card and chicken nuggets, you know, it's it's a great memory. <laughs> Uh, well, so I did the math here in my head. And so your, your oldest is somewhere in her thirties. Uh, how right. old is your youngest? He will be 20 in just a couple of days. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. Wow. So yep. still, you know, just kind of coming out of their teens then. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 And, the, and we went through a real uh, struggle health struggle when we moved to Colorado, that was a, uh, that hit everybody in the family. And we kind of had to flee to the desert for health and for medical help to get through that struggle. And there's another one of those things where it's like, this is not what I had planned, yeah. uh, but here's where we are. And you, you learn things through that. You, it'll, a, a crisis like that will either rip you apart or it'll draw you closer together. And I yeah. think that the latter has happened with us, with our kids and with uh, Andrea. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, uh, like you, I have a, uh, our youngest is a, uh, soon to be 20 year old boy as well. So, um, it's, it's a, it's a great age, although we only have two. So, <laughs> 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 uh, but, um, uh, we, we, we really want to talk about, uh, your, th this, this fun mystery series that you have now that you co-authored with, uh, uh, Jerry B. Jenkins, Red Rock Mysteries. Um, so can you give us an overview of the series, who they're written for, uh, what readers can expect? Of course, we don't want to give away too many of the mysteries. Is there a lighthouse? <laughs> in a, in a <laughs> You know, I can't, it's all set in Colorado where we lived during this time. And I had enough kids that, you know, all the plot lines were coming from the middle school or the high school that they were coming home from. Yeah. I'd say between nine and 13 is the target age. Yep. And we talked about Hardy Boys a little bit ago. Both Jerry and I were hooked on Hardy Boys as kids. And we thought, what if we do a, a Hardy Boys Nancy Drew series with twins Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the boy tells his perspective in one chapter and the girl tells her perspective in the next chapter <laughs> as they're trying to solve the mystery that they're dealing with yes, Bryce yes. and Ashley. And yes. so they have been transplanted from Chicago. They've got a new dad, they've got a stepdad and a stepsister mm -hmm. and their stepdad and stepsister aren't Christians, but they are. And so you have this in uh, this conflict right there, the spiritual conflict that comes in with them being believers, their mother has become a believer, and then they have a little brother too. Um, so the, the arc of the, the series is just what happens in their little town that where nothing really happens, where a lot is happening underneath that they are able to see. Right. And the, the very first, I find that writing, you have to have some kind of a painful thing that happens to you that, that gives you the impetus for the story. As a matter of fact, back here is Ernest Hemingway who said, write hard and clear about what hurts. Yes. So when I, I was, love that painting, by the way, our viewer, our listeners can't see it, but I was going to ask you, it's like, that is the coolest painting. <laughs> I was painting. too. I was wondering, <laughs> yeah, that, I was that's like, actually, that sort of looks like Hemingway. <laughs> one of my sons did that. He did wow. that uh, artistically and, uh, and gave it to me for my birthday of uh, last cool. year, a couple of years ago. Um, but as a kid, I grew up in West Virginia and this is a very kind of an isolated, I lived on a farm. I had two older brothers, but I was basically the baby. And I just kind of wandered the hills and fished and played it, uh, in the Creek and, and sang for minnows and did all those types I want of to things. Whistle, but I had I all this stuff the, that the went on in my head. Andy Griffith song right now. <laughs> 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 Opie and Andy. Um, one, and what happened when I was nine years old, Marshall university had their football team had a plane crash and it killed all of the players and the coaches that were on the, and people from the, the, uh, university that were there, uh, and people from the, you know, boosters that were on the plane. So that was just this huge scar because I had friends who, uh, one friend whose brother was on the plane. So there's wow. like, there's that pain of that. And there were floods, you know, and mine cave-ins. And there was one thing that happened, the Silver Bridge. It was near Christmas one year in the 60s. 
and the silver bridge with all these cars on it collapsed. And the, we would be driving uh, in the car, going on a family vacation or just going to the store and we would cross a bridge and I would get scared mm -hmm. because I had heard about that you know, the silver bridge and how it had collapsed. And uh, some people were saved and some were, did weren't. And, uh, I was just had this deathly fear of falling into the water. Yeah. So in the very first book in the red rock mysteries, I wanted to tackle that fear. And there is a scene where, and it's, it's pretty intense, you know, for young kids as they're, as they're reading, but I, they, they've been able to handle it. And it's where a car goes airborne and then goes into the water and the, the dad is driving, the twins are there and the, their brother, their little brother is in a car seat, you know, buckled in. Mm -hmm. How are they going to get out? What's going to happen to them? Uh, and they've got all these questions about, you know, is God going to take care of them? Is, is he, and they're being chased by the, uh, the villain in the story to get that because they know something that other people don't know. They have information because they've taken a picture of something and they don't know, you know, that, that this is all happening. They don't know why. So I use that, you know, right, hard and clear about what hurts. I use that pain, the fear mm -hmm. to kind of go all the way through the, the series so that the kids are not only solving mysteries, they are confronting their fears. They're confronting the things that, you know, scare them the most. Yeah. And then comes the spiritual angle of these things too, um, that, you know, that I really wanted to deal with. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. We're going to, um, uh, we need to take a break, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we'll be right back on the Bible for Kids podcast. Kids have a lot of questions about God, faith, and the Bible. Why did Jesus come to earth? Who wrote the Bible? What is faith? If you're looking for a great resource to answer some of kids' toughest questions, check out The Big Book of Bible Questions by best-selling author Amy Parker and apologist Doug Powell. With sound theology and kid-friendly terms, Amy and Doug tackle 60 questions covering the Old and New Testaments. The vibrant, playful pictures bring each answer to life and make this book even more fun for kids to read on their own. Plus, you'll love having this book at your fingertips during your family devotions or for those moments when you might need some help with answering your child's questions. The Big Book of Bible Questions is available now from your favorite bookseller. One boy plus two rehydrated squirrels equals hilarious adventures in the Dead Sea Squirrels books written by Mike Naraki. Ten-year-old Michael Gomez finds two petrified squirrels while exploring a cave in Israel and stows them into his backpack, the perfect souvenirs from his trip, or so he thought. When the squirrels get rehydrated during a rainstorm, Michael comes face to face with the rather chatty couple, Merle and Pearl Squirrel, who witnessed Jesus' teachings 2,000 years ago. Hilarious missteps and misadventures happen throughout the series as Michael and his friends navigate life while Merle and Pearl offer wisdom along the way in their own squirrel style. The first six books in the Dead Sea Squirrels series are available at your favorite bookseller, and be sure to look for the Dead Sea Squirrels three book starter pack, which makes a great gift for kids who love to laugh and read at the same time. Welcome back to the Bible for Kids podcast, and Amy and I are speaking with Chris Fabry. So I, I don't write mysteries. I mostly write, um, you know, children's books and board books and for the younger set, but I would guess that writing a good mystery is a unique skill set. It's like writing humor. Mike Naraki over here makes it look easy, but writing humor that's actually funny is a really tough thing to execute. Mm -hmm. And I would guess that mystery has that same unique difficulty. So how do you make sure that you keep the momentum going? Um, I guess sending people flying off a bridge into the water is one <laughs> that way. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good way to do it. Yeah. But how do you keep the kids turning the pages? Well, you have to, as you say, you have to have this ebb and flow and you, I think there is a sense of, um, you've got to, you got to keep the mystery just about on every page a thread of the mystery through there with them asking the questions. And in the middle of that, the way that you glue it together is you allow the personal conflicts that they have with family members or a conflict at school or something that, you know, this happened to me as I was riding home on the bus and I'm really frustrated. And then all of a sudden you'll see something that, you know, the kid will see something that fits in with the mystery. So it's almost like spinning the plates in the air to keep 
all of the engines firing on, you know, an emotional heart level, as well as just the cognitive level with, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what this is here. And the cliffhangers at the end of the, at the end of the chapters are, you know, really, really good. Um, I had one, let me read you one uh, email that I got from a mom. I wanted you to be blessed and encouraged this morning with great news. Each night at bedtime, my nine-year-old son, Neil, and I have been reading through your Red Rock Mysteries, Haunted Waters, heard about it on the radio a while back, and I picked it up at the Christian bookstore. We are enjoying it. I appreciate that the chapters are short, so when they end with a cliffhanger, his frequent request to read one more chapter is pretty easy to agree to. <laughs> and that's what we wanted to do to, to keep the chapters really short, especially if you look at the, uh, you know, boys, I, I really wanted boys to be able to read this series. And yes, that's why I wanted you. the chapters to be really short. <laughs> yeah. But the, the boys chapter is usually a lot shorter than Ashley's chapter. Ashley is co going with all the feelings and the emotions that I mm -hmm. went to hear and the boys saying, you know, here's what's going on in my mind, but let me finish this email. She said, I am a nurse. I work night shifts at times, so he will often read the next chapter to himself when I'm at work, which tells me he's engrossed in the story. Last night, we couldn't put it down until we read to the end of part two and knew Sam, Dylan, and the twins were alive. So there's the, the spoiler alert with the water, <laughs> the car going in the water. <laughs> yeah. and, and she wrote this. She says, at that moment, he immediately said, I want to ask Jesus into my heart. Oh, my husband wow. and I have been praying that he would desire to make a decision to follow Christ. So this blessed our hearts. I knew it would bless yours. Thanks for what you do with your writing and radio. Wow. And I will tell you, you know, I would love to have a bestseller. I would love to have, you know, something that jumps off the charts, but to read about Neil and to read about what happened inside him as he was reading this mystery story, you know, yeah. that he connected God and Jesus and what Jesus had done for him at that yeah. moment. Yeah. Right. That's, that's worth it right there. Yeah. That's that makes so the whole cool. career, the whole lifetime of work worth it. That's awesome. Well, now um, your co-author Jerry B. Jenkins uh, is a bit of a writing legend himself. Uh, so what's it like writing a series with him and how did your each of your strengths lend themselves uh, to the development of these books? It was hard, hard, hard. <laughs> I remember asking Jerry, Jerry worked at Moody Bible Institute in the publishing department at the time when I was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knew that I wanted to write stories and I would give him my ideas and uh he marked them up and it was red everywhere. And he goes, <laughs> finally, he said, if you really want to do this, I can help you, but it'll hurt. And I thought I had no idea what he meant. I just, I knew he knew what he was doing. And so I said, bring it on. Well, when we got the, when I got the chance to write with him with the uh, Red Rock, it was actually the Left Behind Kids series first. We did 35 of those books together. Wow. And then we did 15 of these Red Rock mysteries together. What happened was, he would get, I would uh, show the plot to him. Here's where I want to go with this. And he'd write back and he'd say, watch out for this. Think about this. What if you do this here? Go. And I would write mm. the first draft and I would send it to him. And these are probably, you know, 20, 25,000 words uh, in, in a whole story. So I would write to like 30,000 words, you know, just to, just to get to 30,000 words. And they would come back to me at 15,000 words <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. he, you know, cut and cut and cut. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, oh, okay, so I've got to, I got to go back and do more work here. So I, I thought I'd outsmart him. I'd write 35,000 words. <laughs> the next one comes back. It's 15,000 words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, what is it that he sees that I don't see? Right. What is it that he does in the editing process that I that I can't see because he's always told me, you know, your first draft is always bad. Don't worry about that. It's in the editing that you really make it sing. Right. And so what I think Jerry gave me over those, we wrote 55 kids books together. Wow. What Jerry gave me was an ability to see what he sees when he looks at a manuscript. I still write a really bad first draft, mm -hmm. but <laughs> I'm able to now to, to edit and, and, shape the book like he did. And that was a great gift to me. 
Yeah. yeah, I think it was uh, it was Pascal who said, um, I only uh, made this uh, longer because I didn't have time to make it shorter. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And um, so you tackle some pretty big topics about faith and spirituality through your radio show, which we've talked about and and your other books. So why mysteries for kids and why do our kids need them? Why did you set out to write them? I think it's, it's in us to want to figure things out, you know, to want to see what's hidden. Uh, the, the adult novel that I've written that's, that's out now is all about a treasure hunt. I think it's, it works for adults as well as children, but especially kids. And, and if you think about the books that have really affected you through the years, there's always an element of mystery to it. Why did they do this? And then you figure out, but the main reason why I love books and mysteries and an element of that in it is that a, a really good book will show you someone at the beginning. And by the end, there is some kind of palpable change in them. They have reacted to their situation, their circumstances in such a way and, and not always making the right choices. A lot of times, uh, that's one of the things that we wanted kids to, to see. And this is that uh, being a Christian is not about making the right choice with everything. It's, it's being able to say that you're wrong and repent and turn from that, you know, admit your, your faults and that you don't understand everything and, and move through life. Uh, because if you do everything right, it's the same unrealistic expectations about marriage. If you never have conflict and it's always smooth sailings, then you don't really grow. You're just right. kind of, you're static there. Mm -hmm. So a good story will, a good story is just like God's word. The Bible is a mirror. It will show us our own heart. And uh, just like the, the prophet Nathan did with David, when David had this huge failure, the, the prophet was sent to him to point out his sin. And how did he do it? He told him a story. And he told him a story about an, a man with a little lamb and David was a shepherd at heart. And he was so incensed by this story that, that he said, you know, this is not right. There's injustice here. And Nathan said, this is, this story is you, you are the man. <laughs> and so a good story will sneak around the back door of your heart and it will knock and it will say, here's, here's yourself. Here's who you are. This is, this is what you need to deal with here. That's kind of why I write. Yeah. That's great. Or in Veggie Tales, it was King George and a rubber ducky. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking about that, you know. <laughs> I can when you're talking, this is what Veggie Tales has done to me. When you're talking about Nathan and David, this is what I see a cucumber holding rubber duckies <laughs> with a cabinet full of rubber duckies. <laughs> because I love my duck. So, anyways. <laughs> oh, oh. And that would be in my head all day. Thanks, thanks oh. for that. And I hear Paul Grape is Nathan. So, <laughs> so, so what, what I, I, you know, I want to want to go to the, the Red Rock series again, because um, uh, the, the series takes place in Colorado, which is my home state. So I, I love that. I'm into many concerts at Red Rocks, which is a, a wonderful amphitheater there on the, you know, kind of the, the, the foothills. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but, you know, Colorado is a big state. There's a lot of you know, cool places. Uh, do do your characters travel to different locations in Colorado, or what? What are some of the the places that the kids visit in the books? Yeah, the the very first is about a, a, an abandoned mine, and they're looking for a gold bug. You know, so it, uh -huh. it happens up there in the in the mining area. They go to Lake Dillon, I believe, and uh -huh. Breckenridge around that area. Yeah. But our family lived in Monument, which is between Colorado Springs and Castle Rock. Yeah. And there was a farm just on the other side of the hill uh, that had alpacas. So one of the stories is about uh, the family that has this alpaca farm. They leave and Bryce and Ashley take care of the farm and mm -hmm. take care of the, the dog that's there to, to care for the animals. And um, one of the alpacas gets stolen while on their watch. And there's a, a situation with a, with a dog that 
is going to be, you know, they, they arrest because the dog is, is said to attack someone and they have to figure out so that the dog is not destroyed. They have to figure out what the answer is to this mystery so that the dog will be, his life will be saved. And I, I won't spoil it for you, <laughs> but uh, each of them, each of them are standalone, except for the first two. There's a cliffhanger at the end of the first book that you've got to read the second book in order to, to understand it. There's my favorite is the sixth one. It's called Phantom Rider. And it's when they go to um, Estes Park and oh, yeah. there is a famous writer who lives there who has gone missing and he tells spooky, scary stories and nobody and, and knows Stan- where and he is. Is the Stanley and- Hotel involved? The, the Stanley Hotel is in the background. In the oh, background, nice, nice. Uh, lurking. Uh, but I, I hear from kids that that's the scariest one that they read, but it's their favorite because of the way that it that it all kind of works out and and how the kids the kids aren't just you know these uh little toy characters that walk through they actually really solve the mysteries they are uh they they ride atvs to school you know they have this uh idyllic little uh childhood and of course the the school says you can't do that anymore. They'll take that away from them because you've got to take the thing that they love away, you know, (laughs) so that they, uh, they have to deal with that. But yeah, they go all actually the the kids actually fly back to Chicago too, because that's where they were born and they go on a, they've solved a mystery back in Chicago. So I take you all over the place, Mike. That's so cool. (laughs) That is awesome. And, and Chris, I mean, This is just these this series, even even these 15 books are just really a small portion of the work you do. And so we appreciate you um, coming on and talking to us just about this tiny little focus portion of the huge amount of work that you do. So please tell our listeners um, where they can connect with you, where they can listen to you, where they can find your books. Great. Yeah. If you go to chrisfabrylive.org, you can hear my program and listen to the archives absolutely free. And I bet you'll find Mike Naraki in there somewhere. <laughs> right. uh, and then if you go to chrisfabry.com, you can see a list of my books and uh, some of the things that I've been working on here recently. But thank you two for being interested in this. You know, the, it's, it's rare to have a publisher that will hang on to a series that was written, you know, a few years ago and then put new covers on them, kind of revamp it for another generation. And I'm so thankful for Tyndale for doing that. Yeah. Well, and I saw when I was, you know, looking at information uh, about the books that, you know, when you pull up, when you just Google it, the first covers that come up are kind of dated. And I'm like, oh, these have been out a while. And then I found the new ones and they're so cool. And so, and, and that just lets you know, that the quality of the content is there too. When, when a publisher is willing to go and put new covers on there, you know, they have to make money too. They're not just doing it as a charity. They're doing it because the, the content in those books is good quality content that, that is um, evergreen and that kids love to read um, whether it's the nineties or the, what do we even call this? The the, the, the kids don't, they they didn't use (laughs) phrases like groovy and dynamite. (laughs) Totally rad, maybe in the nineties. And I don't, I don't, I don't even try to keep up anymore. (laughs) Uh, But Chris, thank you so much for being here today and listeners. We're always giving away free stuff on our socials. So be sure to follow us on Instagram or Facebook uh, at the Bible for kids or on our website, the Bible for kids.com. See everyone next time, Chris. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Bible for Kids podcast with Amy Parker and Mike Naraki. Be sure to connect with the Bible for Kids on Instagram, Facebook, and at thebibleforkids.com. The Bible for Kids podcast is powered by the Christian Parenting Podcast Network. Find out more at christianparenting.org. Our show is also available on waynation.com. Christian Parenting.